Let's go to the Lord in prayer, and then we're going to get into our passage this morning in Matthew chapter 20. Would you join me in prayer? Lord, we come before you today, and we do thank you that you have given us this time and this place to gather together. Thank you, Lord, for your spirit. Thank you for faith that we talked about today. God, I pray that all of us have experienced life-giving faith in your Son, Jesus Christ. And Lord, today I stand here, and I stand here as a sinner, and I need forgiveness of my sins. And so I'm asking you today, Lord, to forgive me of the sin that is in my life, that you would place it beneath the blood of Jesus. Lord, that you would help us today as we study this passage. Lord, that you would give us an understanding and help us to be able to apply it to our heart. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Matthew chapter 20 is where I want you to leave your Bible open to today. Brother Meyer had read verses 17 through verses 28, and I don't know if you picked up on this or not, but we're talking really about one word. If we had to put it all into just one word, there's one word that could define this entire passage, and it's the word ambition. In fact, I would ask you the question today, are you an ambitious person? When people think of you, when they talk about you, when you think of yourself, could could individuals look at you and say, now that is an ambitious person? There have been many definitions that have been given for the word ambitious, but I like the way someone had described it. They said ambition usually progresses through the following stages. As a child, you want to be like your dad. As a teenager, you want to be famous. As a young adult, you want to be a millionaire. As an adult, you want to make enough to be able to pay your bills. And as a senior adult, you want to hang on long enough to be able to draw your pension and Social Security. That could be the very definition of what it means to be ambitious. But too often, the church gets a bad rap when we talk about this term and this word, and even the way that we define the word ambitious. What does it mean to be ambitious? There's a prevailing attitude in the church that ambition by nature is selfish. And I simply don't think that that's true. Not all ambitious ambition is selfish ambition. There is something known as selfish ambition, and that would be ungodly. But there's also something known as holy ambition. Ambition is not the enemy in the Christian life. Selfish ambition is the enemy in the Christian life. And I want you to take note of those two things. That is selfish ambition and holy ambition. Now, would you agree today that it's not wrong for you to want to succeed at the work that you do in life? I think all of us want to succeed. It's not wrong for us to want to do our jobs well. And it's not wrong to aggressively pursue goals in our life. If there's one thing I've told you time and time again, it has been that we should be people that have goals in our personal life and even in our walk with God. Oh, and by the way, New Year's is coming up. You know that, right? New Year's is a time where we all set goals for the new year. And I would encourage you to set some of those goals for the new year. However, this I think is where ambition gets a little bit ugly. When we begin to think that ambition is all about us, that's where the problem sets in. And you can see this happen not only in the church, but you can see this happen in the work environment as well. When ambition becomes all about our own ministry or, or we as, as individuals, as peoples, and it becomes all about recognition, that's where ambition becomes wrong. When it's not about helping other people and it becomes more about helping yourself, I think you would say at that point you have the wrong idea of what ambition really means. And that is the kind of ambition that I think uh, Scripture would teach us that we need to avoid in our life. However, there is the, a, a right type of ambition, a type of ambition that every Christian should be able to pursue. It's the kind of ambition that brings recognition to God, but not to ourselves. The goal is, and you've heard this said before, that everything we do should be done to honor and to glorify God. That is our goal. That's our goal as, as believers. And so today I want to look at this passage that we have read already this morning in the Gospel of Matthew because it helps us properly define what holy ambition is and, of course, what selfish ambition is. Now, I'm going to give these to you very quickly this morning, so I hope you'll follow along. And there are 
three basic principles that I want us to focus on. But first, let me re-encount the story as we have read in the passage that the passage was read to us this morning. You have the mother of two of the disciples of Jesus, that would be James and John, and she came to Jesus and she asked a favor. Now listen to what she asked. She wanted to know, could my two sons sit with you in your kingdom, one on the right side and one on the left side? Now, there's one thing that is often overlooked when we hear this story and when we read this story. We hear the mother coming to Jesus and asking this request, but what we fail to recognize is the other Gospels tell us <coughs> it was her sons that actually put her up to this. They said, Mom, would you please go and talk to Jesus and see <coughs> if one of us can sit on his right and one of us could sit on his left. And so what might you imagine Jesus would say at such a request like that? Well, I think following some of these simple guidelines will help us uh, develop a proper attitude about ambition because, yes, these men were ambitious, and yes, the mother of James and John was ambitious. But we can have a, a, a bad ambition in our life, and we don't want that. We want to follow a good, godly, holy ambition. And so how will we do that? Well, Jesus teaches us in this passage. I want you to jot these three things down, and you'll have it here. Number one... Focus on performance and not on your position. Now, Jesus said that in so many words to these men here that day. Focus on what you're doing, your performance, and not on your position. That is what everyone else will think about you. In fact, that is exactly what James and John did not do. Do you see that in the passage there? They did not say, Jesus, we want to do something great for your kingdom. No, what they said was, Jesus, we want to have a place of authority in your kingdom. We want people to know that you're, we are your right hand and your left hand man. Now, church, I'm just going to tell you, that sounds like some Christians. It's not about serving the Lord. It's about getting recognition so people know all that we do. And here's James and John. They were not thinking about what they could do. They were thinking about how well they would be known. They could just sit on the right side and the left side of Jesus. But I hope this morning that you see the difference between the two because they're two very different things. These men weren't as interested in the job description as they were in the job title. And as a Christian, it is very easy for us to fall into that trap. We become more interested in the fame that we can get from it, the recognition that we can get from what we're doing. In fact, maybe you know someone like that, and you think, well, they don't really seem to serve because they enjoy serving. They serve for the purpose of people recognizing them. And if you don't recognize them, then maybe they'll get their, <clears throat> their feelings hurt. And listen, I think we should always recognize the good that people do. But when it comes to serving the Lord, if no one ever recognizes you for the job that you do, you ought to be willing to do it anyways if no one ever says a thing. So let's go back to our text and let's see what Jesus says about this in verse 23 of this passage. Here's what Jesus said. He said, You will, shall drink indeed of my cup and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with, but to sit on my right hand and on my left hand it is not mine to give, but it shall be given to them for whom is prepared of my Father. Now, I find that one little passage to be very, very interesting when we look at this text in its entirety. Jesus is telling them, he was saying, I can talk to you about your job performance. I can talk to you about the things that you are doing. But the job title, he says, is not up to me. And by the way, church, it's not up to us either. It's up to God. So focus on doing what we're supposed to do. Even if nobody ever says thank you, do it anyways. Truly do it for the glory of God. Now, to put this in perspective, let me ask you a question. I want you to think about this. Would you rather be the captain of the football team or would you rather be the guy who wins the game for the football team? Now, those that have unholy ambition would say this, I want to be both. I want to be the captain, and I want to be the guy that wins the game because I want everybody to know how great that I really am. I think you've kind of missed the point if that's what you're thinking. The 
because position and performance aren't mutually exclusive, but neither do they go hand in hand. And if you want to accomplish anything great for the kingdom of God, now listen to this, if you want to accomplish anything great and lasting for the kingdom of God, forget about the titles, forget about the recognition. And I know it's easy to say, but yes, isn't it just a nice thing to say thank you? Yes, and we should be polite, but why are we doing what we're doing? We are doing it for the glory of God. So we focus on our performance, not on our position. That's a lesson Jesus was trying to teach these disciples that day. There's a second thing I think that he's trying to tell them, and here's number two, and that is to be prepared to pay the price. That's what I just read. Jesus said, are you willing to drink the cup that I'm going to drink? Do you remember the passage that says, take up your cross and follow me daily? Do you think Christians understand what that really means today? Well, go back to verse 22, and I want you to see what Jesus says to James and John. Jesus answered them, and what did he say? You know not what you ask. Are you able to drink of the cup that I drink of and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? And guess what they said? Absolutely. Whatever it takes to get that position of authority, whatever it takes to get that recognition, Lord, we're willing to do any of it. Now, when you think about ambition and you think about their ambition, I think they were somewhat misguided in their ambition. And I also believe that Jesus was trying to help them redirect their ambition into a way that would be more pleasing to God. And sometimes that's what we need. At times we get so eager in our life as a Christian, we want to do everything we can to please God. But if we're not careful, it's more for notoriety than it is for really pleasing God. It's very ironic to me that their request came immediately after Jesus just told them that he was going to die. Now think on that for a moment. Jesus says, I'm going to die. And then they request something like this of him. In fact, go back to verse 18. Behold, it says they went up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man said, this is Jesus speaking to them, the Son of Man shall be betrayed unto the chief priest and unto the scribes, and they shall condemn him to death. Jesus says, men, I'm going to die. In verse 19, and shall deliver him to the Gentiles to mock and to scourge and to crucify him, but on the third day he will rise again. Now, Think back to their response. Jesus, just a few moments before that, says to his best friends, I'm going to die. And the request they ask of him is, I know that's all good and well, Jesus, but can we have a position of authority after you die? One on the right, one on the left. I mean, is that not a bit insulting? If I stood here before you today and I said, church, I have some bad news. I went to the doctor this week, and the doctor said, I have one week to live. And then suddenly everybody's lined up at the back, and they're saying, hey, pastor, what are you going to do with that riding lawnmower you got? Hey, pastor, you got any plans for your tractor? Hey, uh, you got extra car, pastor. Is there any way that you would mind just go ahead and giving that to me? You're not going to be here anyways. You're not going to need it. Now, as I mentioned, Jesus just said, I'm, I'm going to die. And still they made this request. So Jesus makes it very clear. And he said to them, if you want to do something great for the kingdom of God, if you really truly want to please God, then you better be willing, first of all, to pay the price. Now, that kind of set them straight, I think, a little bit there. And if you think about it, it's often easy for us to look at those that are being used in great ways in God's kingdom and for the work of the Lord, and we look at them and we think, wow, I would love to get that notoriety, but we don't realize the price that they have paid. You look at great preachers like Billy Graham, and you think, man, that would be awesome to have that type of notoriety and to be able to preach and have thousands and thousands of people that would come. But do you know, Billy Graham told later in his life that if there's one regret that he had, it was spending time away from his family for weeks and weeks at a time, not being able to be there with his children. Well, Jesus says to these men, if you want to do something great, you better be ready to pay the price. And one of the prices that we will have to pay as Christians is there's going to be people that's going to resent us for doing things that God wants us to do, for
are simply following the commands of Christ. Others will adopt a, well, who do they think they are? They think they're better than everybody else. No, we're just trying to serve the Lord. That's all we're trying to do. Now look at verse 24 of our text. It says, and when they heard it, they were moved with, when the others heard it, they were moved with indignation against the two brethren. So you have 10 other disciples that hear that these two men want to be on the right and the left of Jesus when he enters into his kingdom, and the other 10 are filled with indignation. They're in, in, uh, just tore up about this whole thing. Now the question is, why? Well, they're mad because they did not get the chance to ask first. They're sitting there thinking, oh, wait a minute. If Jesus says yes, that leaves us out. And had they got the opportunity and they thought about it, they would have asked the exact same questions. But James and John were the only ones really bold enough to have that question presented. Let me take you very quickly back to the Old Testament. You remember the story of David and Goliath. Goliath had been standing across the valley, defying the very armies of God, putting down the God of Israel, and no one would stand up and no one would fight Goliath. And then there's David, this shepherd boy that comes on the scene, and he enters into the battle and he says, I'll defeat him. I'm not going to let someone talk bad about my God that way. Do you remember the response, the response of his brothers? His brothers didn't say, David, that's a great idea. David, we're here to encourage you. David, we are here to support you. We are behind you all the way. Oh, they were behind him, all right, but they were behind him saying, David has lost his mind. He's just doing this as a spoiled brat so he can get some attention. And of course, you probably know how the story ended up. I mean, they were saying, David, who, who do you think you are? You're just a little shepherd boy. You're on some ego trip here. But David decided being criticized was worth the cost. And at all costs and even losing his life, David marched out there and he took on Goliath. And as Scripture tells us, he defeated Goliath. That, my friend, is holy ambition. That's not being egotistical. That's not being arrogant. That's holy ambition, doing it for the glory of God. Now, there's a third and final guideline, I think, that Jesus teaches us in this passage. First, he teaches them to focus on their performance and not their position. It's a good goal for us as a church. Then he tells them, if you're going to serve me, you better be prepared to pay the price. But he gives them this one final thought. And that is that holy ambition begins and ends with serving others. That's the end of the text that we read there. Jesus is saying holy ambition, it begins and it ends with your willingness to serve others. Will you go back quickly at verse 26 and read along with me? Jesus said, but it shall not be so among you, but whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister. And whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. Do you know the difference between holy ambition and selfish ambition? It comes down to the question of who is being served. Listen to this. Is it someone else or is it you? Is all of your service to Christ so that you can stand in the limelight and people can say, look how great they are? Look what a wonderful Christian that they are. That is a crucial distinction that we must make. I don't know about you, but I want to achieve greatness, but I want it to be through holy ambition, not some sinful ambition. Do we not all want to achieve greatness in the kingdom of God? Do we not all want to be great? Yes, but it's not about the recognition. It's about the service and serving along the journey. There's a story told of a doctor that was imprisoned in one of Hitler's death camps. And in the midst of the horrible conditions that he faced, he offered whatever medical assistance he could to those that were limited and with the limited resources that he had available to him. And he wrote later in a book, but he said, what, he made this discovery one time. 
that people found strength in serving. When there was a sense of despair and a sense of hopelessness, that by helping others in need, he said he noticed that it empowered them. It made them feel better about themselves. And there's a great lesson for us to learn as Christians, and that is that serving energizes us. Serving is something all of us need to do more of, but it's something that we should ask ourselves, are we doing it for the right reason? When James and John came to Jesus with their misguided, I guess you would say, ambitions, what did Jesus do? He rejected them. What should we do with those that have misguided ambitions? Same thing Jesus did. Tell them to concentrate on their performance, not their position. He told them to be prepared to pay the price. He told them to really focus on serving others. I say this, and I mean this with no disrespect, but it's not for any one, two, three, or four individuals. It's for all of us today as I say this. You know what's going to happen the day that this church reads in the newspaper or they hear on the phone tree that you have passed away? I've said this before. They're going to go on. The world's going to go on. The cause of Christ is going to go on. And if we ever have the attitude that it's all about us and the church will fail, if we're not involved, then we've missed the point. Why do we serve? We serve because we want God's kingdom to be great, not so that we will be great. And I'm asking you this morning, as you have heard this passage of Scripture taught, to evaluate, first of all, am I serving? Am I serving in a way that brings honor and brings glory to the Lord? Can I honestly say that everything I'm doing is not for me? It's not so people will say, look how great I am. But so people will see Christ in me and they'll say, look how great God is. And they'll want to be involved in that journey. I think this is a trap that even the best of Christians can fall into. Do you know why sometimes I count it a blessing whenever uh, people will say, uh, Pastor, I enjoyed your message today because sometimes I need the encouragement. And we all need that type of encouragement. And it's going to be hard for you to believe, but just hang with me for a minute. There are days where nobody says, that was a great message. And you know what it does? It humbles me and reminds me, it's really not about me anyway. It's about being consistent and continuing, whether they say a good message or whether they say nothing at all, to be faithful in preaching and teaching God's Word for the right reason. And I want to encourage you, if no one ever comes up to you and says, I just want you to know you're a great Christian, you're doing a great job as a Christian, keep serving God anyways, because our time is short here on this earth. So let's serve God with everything that we have in us. And this time of year, you will certainly have opportunities to let the light of Christ shine in your life. Will you do that? Let's go to the Lord in prayer as we stand together. Father, thank you today for meeting with us. Thank you for being with us, Lord. Thank you for helping us. Thank you for showing us that there's nothing wrong with ambition, but Lord, it needs to be surrounded with a holy ambition that our ultimate desire is to please you. Lord, help us to never take lightly the job you have given us, even in our local church here. Lord, you have given many of us things that we are to do week in and week out. And Lord, there may be times where no one ever says thank you. There may be times where it just seems like such an ungrateful job. But help us to remember we're doing it for you. And Lord, I pray that we would develop that attitude, that servant attitude that all of us should have, every member in this church. Lord, every act of service that we do, help us not to complain. Help us not to find the fault in others. Help us not to look down on others. If someone has done something and we don't like the way they do it, Lord, I pray that we would just say thank you, God, that they're serving you to the best of their ability. Lord, help us to focus on our relationship with you. And God, I would pray today that you would speak to us in a way that only you can because, Lord, we, we need it so desperately. Help us this time of year to learn to be servants, to be better servants. And God, help us to learn 
to serve you better. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.